Assalamu alaikum. My name is Safir Ahmad, and I serve as editor of the publication that's hosting this event tonight. It's called Renovatio. It's the journal of Zaytuna College. And it's my distinct honor tonight, on behalf of Zaytuna College, on behalf of the editorial team of Renovatio, and to welcome all of you in this room, and also to welcome all the people watching us online through live stream. <clears throat> Um, I want to begin, as they say in our tradition, you haven't thanked God if you have not thanked people. So I want to begin with a couple of thank yous. Uh, first and foremost, um, to the Adams Center. Um, they've made this place. Uh, they've allowed us to come here. They have hosted us. And I want to thank Imam Muhammad Majid, the leadership of the of, uh, Adams Center, and particularly two or three people that I've been working with here, um, Ali Khawaja and uh, Shah Imam and, of course, Joshua Salam. So I'm really grateful, and, I was, and it's been an honor to work with everybody, and we're really grateful to the Adams Center. At this time, I think it's appropriate to ask our host tonight, and a great friend of Zaytuna College, a great friend of Imam Zayd, a great friend of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, um, Imam Muhammad Majid, to get us started tonight by saying a few words before we begin the program, inshallah. Please welcome Imam Majid. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, also want you to thank all those who have helped us to have this uh, night to be, inshallah, a successful night. I'm having a uh, full house. Uh, but also want to ask uh, to thank my assistant, Suzy Sharaf, for doing all of the uh, food and arrangement and all kind of things. I would like to uh, to welcome all of you. Zaytuna College is really uh, is the Muslim project in America, uh, and I do believe that that Muslims should take pride of having the first full Islamic college in America. And alhamdulillah that I've seen the progress that Zaytun have been making and the participations of uh, Zaytuna in major institutions, think tank, and the impact that it has in people thinking and how they view Islam in this country. Therefore, my dear Imam Zaid is uh, one of the, alhamdulillah, the national Muslim leader that who encompassed, brought people together all the time. You can all the Muslim from different aspects of, uh, uh, I can say that, uh, religious uh, discourse, uh, they loved this man and respected him. But he's embodied this ethic of disagreement, <laughs> I can say that. And uh, we have uh, two wonderful guests who will be joining him that, alhamdulillah, will be enlightened uh, today with this uh, discussions. I would like to say that this uh, talk cannot come in better time, very timely, very timely, with all the disagreement I see online, social media going crazy, and therefore we need more of this. For I'd like to welcome uh, Zaytuna, to welcome our guest, uh, the professors and, and the intellectuals will be enlightening us tonight. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Thank you, Imam Majid, for those kind words. A um, couple of other thank yous I need to make. Uh, one is to thank a couple of key members of the Renovatio editorial team um, who are not here tonight, but who helped greatly in the planning of this event tonight, especially Najib Hassan, our managing editor, and Carol Nassar, our editorial coordinator. Um, lastly, I want to thank the John Templeton Foundation, which uh, gave us a planning grant last year to help launch the publication that we have now launched, um, and this is our second issue we're working on. The John Templeton Foundation funding was really crucial to us and it helped us to get to this point today. We are grateful that they've recognized the potential for this publication to do the work that it's doing, the value that they've seen, they've seen in it, and they continue to fund it, inshallah. For those who are unfamiliar with Renovatio, um, I'll give you a couple of quick things about it. Um, <clears throat> the fundamental idea behind Renovatio is, as we call it, we want to bridge the gap between academia, people working at universities across the American landscape, and what we call the public square. So our goal is to have scholars, theologians, philosophers, writers, um, to do the work they do, but write 
and do events for a broader public so they make their work and their knowledge accessible to a broader range of people than just their colleagues in academia, in the universities. So that's a fundamental idea, and we also like to have them bring uh, their knowledge of the faith traditions, um, Islamic faith tradition, but also other faiths, and to help us deal with contemporary challenges through the lens of that. So it's in a way, I like to think of it as what we're dealing with here is applied tradition. So bring that knowledge and help us navigate the challenges we all face today and also perennial questions that people have always faced. Um, the, I want to let you know that uh, if you didn't see it on the way in, the inaugural issue of Renovar Show, the print issue is out there on the tables and you can buy your copy on your way out if you haven't done it yet. Um, and for those who are watching online, you can get it, order it from our website, which is renovatio.zetuna.edu. That's not a commercial plug. We're not a commercial operation. That is a public service announcement. Um, before we get started tonight's topic, I have one more guest in the room that I want to uh, invite to the stage to say a few words. He's well known to all of you in the Washington DC area. He's also well known nationally. Um, I'm speaking about Dr. Jonathan Brown. And I want to say a couple of things about him before I bring him up here. Um, you all know that he's at Georgetown University. You know that he is the director of the, <clears throat> uh, the Al-Walid bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. He's the author of sel several books. Um, especially uh, Misquoting Muhammad, The Challenges and Choices of Interpreting the Prophet's Legacy. He also has a relationship with Renovatio. Um, I've been working with him for the last year. He's on, a member of our advisory board at Renovatio. Um, and I would also say that he's, um, he has somewhat of an uncommon trait among people in academia, which is he has already been writing for a while for the broader public. Um, when Renovatio really is about that in many ways. Um, so I've asked him to say a few words that would help place this publication perhaps in the context of the academic journals and how what we're trying to do, what we are ambition, our ambition of doing what we're trying to do, uh, how that f fits in in the landscape of academia and what other academic uh, journals do. So please welcome to the stage Dr. Jonathan Brown. Assalamu alaikum everybody. It's nice to see you. <clears throat> when I was um, coming down from my Maghrib prayer, I was playing a game with myself. I was trying to calculate how little street cred I have. And I calculated it's like negative. The reason I brought that up is in my mind is because I was thinking about being an ivory, in an ivory tower, which is where I live. Um, in fact, so much that I discovered I have chalk all over my uh, jacket. But um, why am I thinking about the uh, academy? Because, uh, well, as Imam Maggie pointed out, uh, we live in a time of a war of ideas. Uh, you, everywhere you look, if you have antenna that are attuned to anything, even if you're not on social media, if you just watch the TV, if you just look at the newspaper, we live in this time of a war of ideas, ideas between conservatives and liberals, ideas between people who are open and closed, ideas people, people who are, look to the past, look to the future, between those who are open to um, Muslims, those who hate Muslims or are scared of them. Um, but uh, it's a war of ideas, right? But we also live in a world of ideas. We live in a world of ideas. And sometimes it's, we forget that because of hurricanes and because of poverty and because of the material forces that so affect our lives. But we also remember human beings live in a world of ideas because we create our world with words. We create our world with words. We create our relationships with each other with words. We create meaning with words. We f express meaning that we feel inside with words. Language is so important. Uh, and it's so important, right? And ideas are so important that someone like me, who has no actual skill, I mean, if this were Mad Max, I'd be, I mean, I'd be lying on the, in the desert somewhere, and all you guys, doctors and whatever, engineers, anybody with any skill would be fine. I would not be okay. okay? But why, so why am I sitting in the university? Why is, why is someone inviting me up here to speak to you? It's ridiculous. Right? Because we live in a world of ideas that's constructed with words. And our society is shaped through education. Education consists of ideas. Ideas are phrased, and ideas are debated, and ideas are shaped with words. With the written word, with the spoken word. 
So if you want to be part of this, of shaping the world around you, if we want to be part in shaping our world here and our world globally, we have to be in the business of expressing ourselves through language, of fighting in this war of ideas, in shaping this world of ideas, right? And, you know, you think about what a journal like this can be. Right? A journal, you think of a journal like The New Yorker, you think of journals like um, you know, The Economist, right? These are uh, publications that have been around, in some cases, for over a century, and are places that people, to which people look for dispute of ideas, for ideas being tried out, for them, for them being discussed, contested, affirmed. Um, we need to be, we need to have a forum to do that. We need to have a forum for Muslims to do that with each other, and we need to have a forum for Muslims to do that with other people of like mind from other religious traditions in this country, and we need to have a forum where we can express ourselves to people who don't, who are not of like mind with us in this country. And, um, well, you could say, hey, I have a blog. What about my blog? I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about, let's say, you know, Jonner. Let's say Jonner has a blog. Jonner blog, okay? Not that there's anything wrong with that. But why, so why this journal? Um, because, like so many things in which Zaytuna College is involved, they have brought together real talent. Uh, Safir Ahmed people, when I found out the, so he's an editor. When I found out the books he had edited, and the people, the authors with whom he had worked, I was almost passed out. Thank God I was sitting down. I was really surprised. Glenn Greenwald, the guy who wrote that book, uh, Don't Think of an Elephant. I can't remember what his name is, but he's really famous. Okay. I mean, really, I, I, when I heard about the books he'd been behind, and if you've ever written a book, you can know how important editors can be. Editors can, in fact, make the book. Sometimes authors aren't even that great. It's the editor who does the work. I mean, to have somebody like this behind the journal, this is really incredible. To have people like Sheikh Hamza, Imam Zaid, uh, Hatim Bazian, Abdullah Hamid Ali, other people uh, just sitting there waiting to write. And so many other Muslim intellectuals, so many others, not even non-Muslim intellectuals, eager to write because they respect the people involved and they respect the Muslim community. This is a real opportunity. And I, I just want to end by saying, like so many things about Zaytuna, this, in my opinion, we could sit and talk about lots of strengths of Zaytuna College, but in my opinion, the strength of Zaytuna College is diversity. Diversity. Not because I love diversity, although I do. I was one of the first people to support diversity, in case you're wondering, right? The, that's a joke. But the, the point, not because diver, diversity for its own sake, because diversity means institutional strength. Okay? Communities, when they're young... They're focused on individuals. What does Sheikh so-and-so say? What does Imam so-and-so say? Sheikh so-and-so dies. Imam so-and-so dies. Sister so-and-so dies. This is what happens to human beings. People are fallible. People are mortal. Institutions live beyond that. In order to build institutions, you have to transcend the individual. You have to bring diverse people together so that people know that a place isn't just about one person or one type of person. It's about... Quality, a guarantee of quality. Like when people think of Al-Azhar, probably wrongly now, they think of reputation, of tradition, of knowledge, of respect. This is what building an institution does. It gives you something that lasts. It gives you something that transcends the individual. It gives you something where you can bring lots of different people together. I mean, you look just in the founders of Zaytuna. Look at the three founders of Zaytuna. Very different backgrounds. Very different opinions on a lot of things. And yet they all work together to build one common uh, institution. This is a, the strength of Zaytuna, in my opinion. It's the strength of Renovatio. It can be a place, a forum for Muslims to discuss all their ideas, all their disputes, in an educated, uh, articulate, civilized way, and edited by someone who is uh, eminently qualified to do so. So I really encourage you, you know, support the journal, buy a copy, read it, enjoy, look forward to future articles and future issues. Jazakum Allah khair. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I think I might invite you to every event we do. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so on to tonight's program. Um, the topic we have chosen for tonight is the art of disagreement. Um, 
It fits into the journal's mission because our mission really is to affect the public discourse around religion, around faith, and contemporary challenges. And we cannot engage with people. We need to learn how to engage with people we disagree with. We need to have conversations with them. So that's why we thought it was a good idea to, to focus um, this event and a couple of articles coming up um, in the next issue, which will be done next month, um, about this issue of how do we actually learn to disagree with people and is there's actually some skills required, some knowledge required for that. Clearly, we, you are all aware, we are all aware that we live in an incredibly polarized society. Um, people are joining movements, people are joining groups, people are defining themselves by their identity as a member of a race, a nation, a sexual orientation, a particular ideology, and on and on. And this fragmentation, combined with the confrontational approach that people have with, to those we disagree with, uh, it makes for a really bad sort of public discourse. It makes for a very harsh language, a lot of accusations flying, you know, a shouting match is what it turns into, frankly. And we, people talk past each other all the time. So we thought it was really, you know, we need to start to figure out how to do this a better job as Muslims, but also as people of faith broadly and people of other religions as well. How do we begin to engage in a way that can be received well and that we receive those we disagree with a little better? So we, um, and I, I don't need to tell you that the online forums, the social media has sort of exacerbated that problem. Um, the cacophony has just grown louder because of that. Um, so we've invited two speakers tonight to help guide us a little bit um, we might, so that we might begin to do a better job of both speaking with each other and listening to each other. Uh, not just hearing each other, but really listening to each other and trying to understand each other. Um, what we felt we need in this public discourse right now is a little bit more light and a little less heat. So we need to learn to bring the temperature down. Um, our speakers are both from very, two very different backgrounds. Um, but we thought it might be interesting to get their perspectives and because they have very different experiences, different, um, one has been steeped in academia, the other person has been sort of um, steeped in the society and in certainly the Ummah. Um, so we will do that and the format for tonight's program is very simple. Um, each speaker will come up here and talk for maybe 15 or 20 minutes and then after they both finish talking, I'll, um, then the three, I will get on the stage with them and have some co a conversation with them um, and throw some questions at them and really try to get a conversation going about some real challenges we all face, inshallah. So let me introduce our first speaker. Um, Dr. John Dagli is an associate professor of religious studies at the College of the Holy Cross in Massachusetts. He specializes in Quranic studies, interfaith dialogue, and philosophy. He was an editor of the study Quran, which came out a couple of years ago. And he was among the Muslim signatories of the letter, a common word between us and you, an appeal to Christian world leaders for peace and cooperation between Christians and Muslims. Dr. Dadley holds an MA from George Washington University right here, um, depart their Department of Religion, and a PhD from Princeton University's Department of Near Eastern Studies. And he was also, um, about a decade ago, a Fulbright Scholar. Before I ask him to come up, I want to say two quick things to you about him. I've had the pleasure of working with him for the last year. He's also on our advisory board. And I've been working with him on an article, which we will publish, inshallah, next month about the topic for tonight's program. Uh, so you should look for it. It'll be online, and it'll be in our next print issue. Um, and it has been an honor for me to work with him and to learn from him. Um, he's, a, he's a fount of knowledge in many ways. Uh, secondly, he's written this excellent article um, that we're currently preparing, so we will have that, um, so keep an eye out for that. So without m further ado, I would like to ask you to please welcome to the stage Dr. Jana Dagli. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I'm sure that approximately 100% of you are waiting for Imam Zaid to come up, so I'll, I'll try to stay within my time. And... Uh, 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 but I, I also want to thank the organizers. I want to thank uh, Safir for, for inviting me. And it's a, I'm very pleased to be in this beautiful building, which I understand was just really recently um, expanded. And it's, it's, it's beautiful, mashallah. So, Mabruk. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an honor for me to be here to be talking with you for, for a short time. 
so the title of the talk is, of the event, is The Art of Disagreement. Now, uh, disagreement and agreement, from a certain point of view, are really two sides of one coin. And it, it seems as though we're not on that side of the coin in the, in the contemporary discourse. We're really on the other side of the coin, which is a kind of a chaos, which is, uh, which is endemic to the public sphere and public discourse and so forth. And um, I want to be able to understand why this is the case by not just talking today about things like the ethics of disagreement. Uh, there's a very developed tradition within Islam of, of dealing with these matters. You, you, know, you have topics like... Uh, for example, adab al-bahath, the idea of how to have a proper disagreement with somebody. That's a very well-developed discourse in Islamic civilization, how to properly, the, the, the proper adab to have with people when you disagree with them or how, when you talk to them. These are all very important topics, but it's not what I'm going to focus on um, in my remarks tonight. Uh, what I'd like to do is to expand our, our scope of vision to be able to look at things in a slightly deeper way. The main, my main thrust tonight is that um, is that disagreement and agreement, the art of disagreement uh, comes from, I thought that was me, the art of disagreement really comes from the art of thinking. And the problem with us today is not so much that we, we, you know, we, we, we have discord at the social and cultural level, which we do, but that we have fragmentation and, and failure at the level of ultimate questions. That is to say, not just political or social cultural questions, but at the level of ultimate questions. And I'll say more about what I mean by ultimate questions. And so when we don't think clearly, we, we, we even fail to disagree, right? So we, we usually think about the failure to agree, but really what we do in, in, in the present context, we fail even to disagree. To disagree means to have a coherent idea about where you are and where, the, where your interlocutor is coming from, and we know that this really happens very rarely. So we don't have harmony or discord, but as I said, we have chaos, chaos. Um, because the problems, the usual problems are, are familiar. We have the problem of demonization of the other. We have the inability or unwillingness to, to, to listen to people. We have groupthink, uh, kind of herd mentality. And also just when, you know, when, when you're in the public sphere or when you're online or when you're talking to somebody, you have the, the vices, the, the traditional vices. You have arrogance, you have timidity, you have various kinds of passions which enter into um, into debate and, and when people talk to each other. Now, these, these are all real problems, and we all face them all the time. Uh, and they have immediate causes, and we can point to them as, as immediate causes, but they also have deeper causes. They also have ultimate causes. So, for example, if you hurt your back uh, lifting a couch, uh, the immediate cause is that you, 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 you lifted the couch, but the deeper cause, you might say, the conditions for that is that you know, you don't exercise enough, so, you, so your muscles aren't strong. And, and also, nobody taught you how to lift a couch the proper way. And so, it's not, there's an immediate cause, but there's also a deeper cause for why, that kind of, why those kind of problems happen. So, how does that relate to the topic at hand? And we have a media culture. We have, we have a social media culture, which is almost not even a culture. We have political culture, educational culture, you know, different kinds of culture, different levels of culture. Uh, we, but we also have what... I would call a culture of ultimate questions. A culture of ultimate questions. What, what do I mean by that phrase? Every civilization, uh, whether it's a religious civilization or whether it's modern civilization, has this culture of ultimate questions, which is the institutions, the people, the ideas, uh, the literature, the, 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 the kind of streams within, within the civilization that are responsible for exploring, for posing questions, for exploring ultimate questions like, what is reality? Uh, what is the nature of knowledge? Uh, what is the nature of the good? What does it mean to live a good life? Uh, what does it mean to live a life with purpose? You know, where are we going in the universe? What is the nature of God? The, 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 and by ultimate questions, in other words, those questions which are at the boundary of all possible explorations. And every culture, whether it has a, a properly functioning culture of ultimate questions, or a badly functioning one, has one, right? Islamic civilization traditionally before, it, before it's, I mean, now it's fallen on rather bad times, but Islamic civilization in its heyday had uh, this culture of ultimate questions, and essentially the people who were responsible for running it were the theologians, the mutakallimun, the philosophers, or the falasfa, or the hukama, and uh, the, the Sufis, the, or tasawuf, um, or sometimes translated as the mystics. 
which is to say that be, in, in these various fields of endeavor, you had people whose job it was to, to, to talk about these things, to explore them, to, to provide answers for people, and so forth. And when you have a, a healthy, functioning culture of ultimate questions, you have, I would argue, that's, this is one of my main claims, you have a healthy society, and that it's very difficult to have a healthy culture and a healthy civilization without a properly functioning element to the civilization which deals with these kinds of questions because they have a knock-on effect. So what about modern society? What about modern civilization? Right? We're, we, we're, there's not a lot of Sufis and you know, Sufi theologians and metaphysicians of the old sort around anymore. What is the modern culture of ultimate questions, which is, by the way, the global culture of ultimate questions? It's not as though there's multiple such cultures anymore. We all live in a global society. There's no, we as Muslims can't detach ourselves and say, well, here's modernity and here is us. We're all sunk in the same and embedded in the same culture. And so, what is it? Basically, it's three areas, or, which, which correspond to three um, sort of institutional areas. Science, you might say science with a capital S. Philosophy, right, with a capital P. And then art, which, which sometimes goes under the name culture. Right? So between science, the scientists, scientific ideas and so forth, philosophy, philosophers and so forth, Art, artists, novelists, and that includes things like literature and, and film and so forth. These are the, you might say, the territories or the domains in our, in our culture, in our society, where people go to get their answers to their most basic, deepest questions. Right? They're, they're, like, uh, beyond these areas, there's not really places where such questions are asked. And these three domains of modern life correspond roughly... And here it's going to get a little bit abstract, abstract, but I'm going to try and bring it to some more specific examples. Science, philosophy, and art correspond roughly here to the basic three ways or the three modes of thinking, the three dimensions of thought that people have when they think about ultimate questions. Number one, you have people's notion of what reality is. What is? What, what is the nature of reality? Secondly, you have the dimension of thinking which is what is possible or what can be? You know, what is possible, impossible, necessary, um, probable? And finally, what ought to be? That is to say, what's good and bad, what's beautiful and ugly and so forth. These are sort of the three very general domains that, that science, philosophy, and art and culture, generally speaking. Um, that is to say, what, what is reality, how things work, and how it should all fit together? Let me give you an example so it's not too abstract, very concrete. If I make a statement that says, uh, the sun is below the horizon and will rise tomorrow at 6.32 a.m., seems like a, you know, that seems like a very plain statement to make. Now, how is it that you can see embedded in this these three dimensions of thought? Well, first of all, if you make the statement, the sun is below the horizon and will rise tomorrow at 6.32 a.m., uh, you first of all believe in some vision of what reality is. There's a, there's a thing called the sun, and there it is. I, I believe that it's there. Secondly, you have this notion that celestial objects like the sun and the earth, uh, they, they behave in a certain way. That there's a certain way in which, for example, if the sun is below the horizon, it's impossible for it to be above the horizon. The fact that you don't see it above means that it's definitely below. This is, a, in a sense, a judgment that's made. That's a different, it's, a different, um, it's not a grasp of reality as it is, but it's a grasp of reality based upon what you know to be possible, impossible, probable, and so forth. And then finally, the question of what ought to be, or judging what's good and bad, is the fact that in order to be able to make a statement like that, it requires a tremendous amount of trust in institutions, believing in the credibility of scientists, and so forth and so on. So even to make, so for example, how do we know that it's going to rise tomorrow at 6.32 a.m.? I mean, it requires a tremendous amount of reliance upon other people judging, well, is this person a liar or, or, or a truth teller? Is this institution reliable or not? And so forth and so on. There's a lot of different examples that, that, that one can use, but I just wanted to establish it as a topic. So, um, and my, my main sort of argument here, you might say the main thing to keep in mind is that these three aspects of thinking, thinking about what is, thinking about what's possible, thinking about what ought to be and what's good and bad, they go together like three dimensions of space, right? For, so, for example, imagine you're flying a plane. You have to know the altitude, you have to know the latitude, and you have to know the longitude, or else you don't know where you are. Right? So when it comes to thinking, it's the same thing. You have to know what you think reality is, you have to know what you think is possible, and you also have to know what you think is good and bad in order for you to really understand, you know, to use that metaphor, you know, where you're coming from or where someone else is coming from. And so if I can just, again, be a little bit abstract, for maybe there's a few people 
there's a few kind of uh, uh, nerdy types online. You, you might say that every, what I'm saying is every factual claim is embedded in a theoretical claim and dependent upon a moral claim. Every theoretical claim is about a factual claim and guided by a moral claim. Every moral claim presupposes a factual claim and is chosen by a theoretical claim. Now, that's extremely kind of abstract, and maybe you didn't catch any of that. So I want to make it more concrete. What do I mean by that? These domains of, of science and philosophy and art in the modern context, in modern civilization, essentially in the picture I'm painting is that they share a kind of a division of labor to, to deal with ultimate questions, right? So it's, re, you know, when, when it comes to values and, you know, what we think is beautiful or good, you know, we, we, we don't really ask scientists, we, we, we ask artists, we ask novelists, we ask people who are writing literature, and there's, and there's a kind of a different division of labor. But the problem in modern society is that this division of labor is not harmonious. It doesn't work together well. It's very discordant, right? These domains of science, of philosophy, and art, they don't work, they don't, I mean, to sort of, they don't play well together, you might say. And they're always trying to define themselves against each other, um, and um, you know, and each one is always trying to say, no, we're not the other two. The problem with that is that when any of these domains, whether it's science or philosophy or art, or the, whether it's a focus on what reality is, or it's a focus on, let's say, logic and reason and imagination, or a focus on values and, and beauty and aesthetics and ethics, uh, without being aware of the other two domains, you can't properly carry out that, the, the one. The, all three of them have to be there for any one of them to function properly. So, for example, I'll, I'll give you now some very concrete examples of how this works, how it is that this kind of fracturing and fragmentation in the modern culture of ultimate questions leads to problems that then affect the, problem, the, the question at hand, which is the problem of disagreement. So problem number one, problem number one that arises from this fracture and fragmentation between these, uh, these various domains. Number one, and you've, you've seen this and you've run across it, you have the invocation of evidence without making clear your interpretive assumptions and your framework, and without acknowledging one's authority structure. That is to say, you make a claim about saying, well, this is obvious, this is obviously true, this is what reality is, but you don't tell people that, well, by this, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that reality works in such and such a way, and you know, this, this is what I expect to happen, and moreover, these are the individuals that I trust to tell me what's true. Right? And we all, we cannot function without that. The, great, the best example of this in the, in, in the contemporary context are the new atheists, who are really just the most aggressive subset of, of something that's called scientism. That is to say, believe anything that scientists say in the name of science. Right? It's just, well, it's obvious what's true. Right? It's ob well, but it's not obvious what's true. Right? Because, because the study of nature, for example, depends a lot upon what questions we ask of nature. You could say, well, the experiment told us that such and such is true. But then, well, what told you which experiment to run? You see, th these are important questions that arise. So number one, the first problem is in the invocation of evidence without acknowledging those, uh, the theoretical framework and the moral framework. The second problem are methods of analysis. That is to say, what is a, what is a method of analysis in this context? That is to say, it's, it's, it's a way of figuring out how to interpret and understand the world. For example, Marxism is a method of analysis. It tells you what's possible or necessary or can't happen or has to happen. Um, uh, evolutionary psychology is a method of analysis about human nature. Uh, and you have different thinkers who maybe whose names you don't know but who are tremendously influential in the academy and in, and in, and in literature and the humanities, people like Foucault and you know, Nietzsche, Derrida, and so forth, and others. And basically, the second problem is when you have a method of analysis that forgets what it's about, and also what the moral picture of the world is that guides that analysis. And I'll, and I'll give you a very specific example of this. When, when you go to study it at the university, you're often presented with these ideas that will tell you, for example, that human beings act not because they're independent and they have a will and they're rational, but because they're determined by this or that outside factor. It's gender that makes them do what they do. It's race that makes them do what they do. It's language that makes them do what they do, some other aspect of culture, uh, class. All of these things basically are the way in which we can sort of say, well, look at what human beings are doing. We can explain what human beings are doing completely and utterly by these outside factors, which has the logical problem that if you're explaining all human behavior, let's say in terms of power, that it's just all desire for power. Well, then that theory itself is all about a desire for power, too, and it invalidates itself. 
So that's, that's a second kind of problem. The third kind of problem, problem number three, is you have moral or normative demands that are unconnected with uh, the set of choices that, out of which they're deemed best, and secondly, an account of human nature that renders such possibilities intelligible. I'll give you a concrete example of what I mean by this. Um, uh, we're told, for example, that art is subjective, right? That values are just a thing. Values are a thing that you, you can have. You know, you can't argue about, you can't talk about them. You just have them. Like, you have a value and I have a value. And these are not things that can be discussed. Is that, is that the issue? I'm sorry. No, oh, sorry. Um, so you, you have so moral or normative demands that are made without kind of acknowledging one's theoretical approach or by, by taking into account what reality is. So another example, again, out of philosophy, you have this kind of disavowal of moral thinking. Really, this is a real kind of problem in the academy, this disavowal of moral thinking, which is nonetheless carried out by people who have a kind of a moral program. Right? So people who have, to use the political parlance, they have an agenda, you might say but then they claim to not have an agenda because they're sort of above the idea of right and wrong. That's very kind of naive, they say. But nevertheless, it, it hides a kind of a moral agenda. Now again, that's all somewhat theoretical and kind of abstract, and you might think, what does that have to do with disagreement? What does it have to do with the art of disagreement? What does it have to do with what happens in the comments section on the internet? You know, what does it have to do with what happens in the mosque? Uh, and I, and I, think, I think these three, these three problems have a very deep effect because number one, the first problem, this idea of invoking evidence without thinking that you have to talk about your theoretical framework, produces people, not just people on, the, not just people on social media, but people in the academy, scientists, uh, th people who we look to for their ideas, people who think that what they believe is obvious and it doesn't need an argument. It's just obvious. It doesn't really need an argument. I mean, think of a figure like Richard Dawkins or, or his you know, kind of evil henchman Sam Harris. I mean, there's not really an argument there. It's kind of, it's, it's clear what you should believe, and if you don't, there's just something wrong with you. Either morally speaking, you're stupid. Because it's so obvious. The second, the second problem produces people who believe that, uh, if, you, it, if you believe that other people's beliefs are always determined by race, or by power, or by gender, or by some, uh, some outside fight, or by the very structure of their language, um, you're going to not really feel the need to pay attention to their arguments or to pay attention to what they have to say. But you're just going to be saying, well, I don't need to listen to what you say because I know what group you belong to. I know where you come from, and that explains everything that you have to say. There's no reason to pay attention to you. The third problem is that you produce people, that is to say the, dis the disconnection of, of, of moral uh, commitments from discourse, from, from the theoretical and, and factual framework, it produces people whose goals and their agenda is essentially hidden. It's kind of hidden from view. They pretend that there's no reason to talk about right and wrong or good and bad. It's kind of passe. But nevertheless, they have that aspect of things. And so it's hidden from other people. But actually, sometimes it's hidden from themselves. And they have a very poorly articulated vision of what's right and wrong. And the problem with having a non-articulated vision of what's right and wrong and the problem with you know, thinking that you don't need to talk about what's right and wrong philosophically or to articulate it, is that your views cannot be critiqued. You, you, you sort of, you have a position and there's no arguing about it. And so what does this produce? You have, you have, an, you have not just, a, not just the, the comment section on the, on the internet, but you have the university. You have scientists, philosophers, artists, who, who, and, and you have these rampant problems of people who think that what they think is just obvious. You have a problem that you don't need to listen to other people because what they think is really determined ultimately by these outside factors extrinsic to them. And thirdly, you have people who don't know how to articulate their moral views or don't think they need to and, who never, and, never, and for that reason fall into a kind of a sloppy thinking or in some cases a kind of a tyrannical mode of thinking where they just sort of assume that they have to force their views on other people because they can't think rationally about it. These three problems have a very anti-rational character. They're really, dis they're really toxic, they're poison thought, they make it incapable to th of thinking. This has a knock-on effect. That is to say, if, so if you go to school, if you go to college, and not all, not every single last one, but if, if most of your professors or a good number of your professors in the sciences, in the humanities, and so forth and so on, are suffering from these intellectual problems, right, at a deep level. If the, if the books that you're reading have these problems in them, 
then of course it's going to have an effect because you're, you know, if, when you go, you know, your favorite author that you read might not sound like he's a philosopher, but he's read philosophers. He's affected by it. Your favorite political activist is affected by these ideas. Right? Your favorite, let's say, scientist or engineer or so forth, when they study in school, these ideas seep into them. And I think there's a very strong connection between this deep level, you might say the sickness and the fragmentation at the level of ultimate questions, and it makes its way into the, into the, it makes its way into the broader society, sometimes invisibly, most often invisibly. Now, you might be wondering why up until this point I haven't said anything about religion. Because, well, isn't religion part of the culture of ultimate questions? Right? That's re what's more ultimate than religion? The, po the problem is that modern culture defines itself against religion. Each of these domains, science, defines itself against religion. Philosophy defines itself against religion. Art defines itself against religion. And we have to sort of also keep that in mind. And actually, I would argue that modernity's fragmentation, I can't argue this, but I want to leave you with this thought, is that modernity's fragmentation, these kind of fragmentation of the, these ideas, historically, I think if you study it, is a direct result of the fact that modernity represents a kind of a rebellion against religion. So what can you do about this? I mean, this, this is all a kind of a diagnosis. You know, what, what can be done about this? Well, I think at a minimum, intelligent people, when they're... You know, when you're reading The New Yorker or you're listening to a political speech or, or what have you, when you're interacting at this level of, of disagreement, you can have a kind of an approach of a kind of an intellectual self-defense, a kind of intellectual self-defense. Just the way a pilot, as I mentioned before, a pilot has to keep track of the altitude and the longitude and the latitude. Uh, you know, when you encounter ideas, you can have a way of situating yourself by, by trying to, let's say, look at all three of these angles. So, for example... You might ask yourself, am I disagreeing with somebody's factual claim? Is, is this a problem at the level of fact? Or is this a problem of a mode of analysis? Is the, is, the mo is the way in which they're analyzing the world and assuming how things work different from mine? Or are their moral commitments different from mine? Or a combination of the three? And I think we, we have to be able to, even when we don't fully understand it, and we can't all become philosophers or scientists or understand the deep you know, motivations of art, but we at least have to be aware that there's a connection at that level. And that, and that you know, it, it, if we're awake to it, you can then begin to, you might say, compensate for it. Maybe you can't change other people, but it can at least help you to become a little bit more, you might say, sane and also grounded when you're encountering disagreements of various kinds. Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dagli, for that. Um, Hang on to some of those ideas he talked about because we're going to try and apply some of those ideas to contemporary challenges in the conversation later, inshallah. Now on to our next speaker. Um, he doesn't really need an introduction, but I'm going to say two or three key things about him um, because he's one of the, if not the hardest working imam and scholar in the United States. Imam Zaid Shakir is, first of all, a co-founder, a senior faculty member, <clears throat> and a scholar in the, um, and a member of the Zaytuna College faculty. He has taught courses in Arabic, Islamic spirituality, contemporary Muslim thought, Islamic history, and politics, and also Shafi Fiqh. He's regularly included as one of the Western world's most influential scholars in the Muslim 500. Um, and because of his tireless work on behalf of the Muslim community, he has truly earned the title. We've sort of bestowed it on him, I think when I say we, the Ummah itself, which is America's Imam. And we could not think of a better person to help us navigate our differences tonight. Because Imam Zaid is all about bridging differences, about people understanding each other, and about lowering the temperature and bringing a, um, a smile upon every face in the room when it, whenever he walks into the room. Uh, when I mentioned to Imam Zaid uh, a few weeks ago that we wanted him to address this topic on the art of disagreement, um, and the idea was to how do we disagree without disengaging, he looked at me and he said, so you want me to talk about how to disagree without being disagreeable? <laughs> Inshallah, I will do it, he said. Brothers and sisters, please welcome Imam Zaid Shakir. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah. Amr rahim alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salat wa salam ala Sayyidin al-Mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam tasleem al-kathira. ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك سبحانك لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته 
وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. الحمد لله. It's a great honor to be here. First time in the New Adams Center. It's really beautiful. The community should be very proud of uh, this phase, this new phase in the life of a, an institution that has been an integral part of not just the Muslim community here in the uh, Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia area, but the wider community. And so, uh, mashallah, it's beautiful, very uh, inviting, and we pray that we're blessed to come here many, uh, many more times in the future. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Jack Brown and Dr. Janir for enriching Renovatio and therefore participating in the Zaytuna College project uh, with their very unique uh, contributions that add uh, a, a healthy degree of diversity. And I think I would agree with the statement that Zaytuna College has really done something that you usually don't see. It's very uh, rare in this country to find people who have graduated from the same uh, colleges or Islamic institutions working together towards a project. But alhamdulillah, we've brought to Dio Bandis together with uh, the Hanafis and Shafis and uh, black, white, different Arabs, Desis, for lack of a better word. Uh, people of different perspectives, backgrounds, different ages, Christians, uh, together to work towards uh, something. And we've been blessed by Allah Ta'ala. And it's only due to the blessings of Allah Ta'ala to hold that together for now well over a decade. So Allah's Rahim and Kareem, Rabbil Alameen, Dhul Fadl al -Azim. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. In the mid-80s, some of you recall, there was a very influential philosopher from the University of Chicago, Dr. Alan Bloom, wrote a book called The Closing of the American Mind. <clears throat> and his argument was that this, this culture uh, that nurtured uh, our, that provided rather the foundation for our common intellectual, civic, cultural life, that this uh, canon of ideas and great works, if you will, was being systematically removed from our higher educational curriculum. And with its removal, the conversation that it facilitated and the conversation that taught us how to disagree without being disagreeable, was being removed from our social, cultural, political, intellectual life. And if someone thinks of that canon, uh, they might just think of dead white men. That's how some people would look at it. But those uh, great minds, they disagreed more than they agreed. Plato disagreed with Thucydides. Aristotle disagreed with Plato. St. Thomas Aquinas dis disagreed with St. Augustine. But in understanding the nature of what were the common elements that still kept them and many, many others, all the way up to Karl, Karl Marx and beyond, what allowed them to be identifiably part of a common tradition, a shared intellectual, cultural political, civic tradition, identifying those elements, thinking about them, thinking about the nature of their disagreements around the great questions of justice, war and peace, uh, the foundations of society, what were the prerequisites of a viable social life or civic life. These questions preoccupied their minds and it provided them the opportunity to critique each other's thoughts while working towards a higher, more noble outcome. 
That tradition was hijacked. Not, not from without, but from within. If some people would say it was hijacked by the, the Marxist or the anarchist, Karl Marx would be considered part of that tradition, not something, someone external to it. Das Kapital would be considered one of the great books that one would study to be thoroughly conversant with Western civilization. And so it was hijacked from within, not from without. And as a result, one of the results, in addition to everything that uh, Dr. Jenner stated, there was a, 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 a relativism, the idea of relative truths, that I don't, I don't have to discuss with you about your truth, whether it's actually truth. I don't have to engage in any debate. I don't have to defend my truth because there's multiple truths. I have my truth. You have your truth. Nothing to argue about here. We just accept that, that you're, that's a valid way of seeing it. I have a valid way of seeing it. And, and so let's just go and drink tea and be friends. Right? But where's the, uh, where's the, uh, where's, where's the ability to critique? How's that ability being nurtured by this approach to life? And what happens when the problems in society become so daunting that we feel there has to be a solution? This is where the problem comes in. Because the only real solution is my solution. So if my truth says we should approach the problems in society this way, that's the only way. And if yours say we should approach it that way, for you, that's the only way. And because we don't see, we don't have a paradigm, if you will, an infrastructure to nurture these disagreements, then we yell at each other. And we try to shut each other down. And we try to get each other disinvited from speaking at our campus and poisoning the minds of our precious youth. And, and imagine the disservice that you're doing to someone in the name of protecting them. The old saying, when I grew up, <laughs> it's so far back in the day, it's night back there. <laughs> but one of the first things your parent taught you when they sent you off to school, remember that first day you got your little lunchbox and whatever is the Vogue at the time, Barney or the Ninja Turtles, or way back in the day, ours was the Flintstones, right? <laughs> and you scurry off to school, and you come, <laughs> like, what happened? So-and-so called me a name. What did they call you? <laughs> and what did my mother said, listen, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you. In other words, there are a lot of people out there in the world that are going to call you names. Get used to it. Insulate yourself against it. Inoculate yourself, because you have a life to live. And if every time someone calls you a name, you're going to break down crying or have a nervous breakdown or pitch a fit, you're not going to be able to live a productive life. This is the nature of the world. And so it's a disservice to pretend that there's some sort of attainable utopia where no kids get called names. Or no adults have the ideas challenged. And so we as Muslims have to see ourselves because we've gone, we're, first of all, we're affected by the closing of the American mind and all of the other cultural, social, political trends, fads, legitimate uh, issues that, are pre pre that prevail in our society. Because in addition to being Muslims and things that were mentioned earlier, we're also Americans. And we're not insulated from the individualism like the, the frontier spirit. It's time to move further west when you can see the smoke from your neighbor's chimney. So that, that self-reliant, rugged, frontier individualism, that affects us because we're, we're Americans. 
And we live in this environment. And so the, the ideas and things that are happening, the words that are being uh, come into popular usage, they affect us as much as they affect any other American. But we're also Muslims. And as Muslims, we should understand that the Muslim mind has also been systematically closed. And that the great canon of Islamic works, that no one was really considered not just a scholar, a serious student of knowledge, if they didn't endeavor to engage those works, and if they didn't recognize the stature of the authors of those works. And so by eliminating a lot of that, by and large, we've also closed our minds and we've become uh, vulnerable in addition to what we're vulnerable to as Americans and just growing up in the environment and milieu that has shaped us, we're also vulnerable, vulnerable to those Islamic influences that close and narrow our minds and take from us the ability. We don't, we don't even know about this tradition of al-bahth wal munadhara how to discuss and profitably debate ideas. We don't know it exists. What's that? We know Quran, we know Sunnah. But when you start talking, oh, there's a science and a set of uh, uh, strictures or procedures to govern how we talk to each other, we don't even know it exists. And so what I like to do in the balance of my time, someone said, you just took all your time. <laughs> in the balance of my time, is just to break it down to an easily digestible level that the average Muslim can understand. Because one thing I think is very important for us to do is to be able to do something Kipling. We'll, we'll pardon him for the white man's burden. But if, that's a great poem. It's in all of your graduation speeches. But one of the things he says in there, if you can walk with kings and yet not lose the common touch. You know, sometimes we, not we, some of us, can become so accustomed to walking with kings that we, far from losing the common touch, we don't even acknowledge that common people exist with their common problems and their common issues and those common things that, if you're not attuned and sensitive to them, can just be distractions for people. But the Quran speaks to everyone. It speaks to the kings and it speaks to the commoners. It speaks to the clergy, if you will, and it speaks to the laity. It speaks to every, if you will, also. It speaks to all of us. So I just want to remind myself and remind you one thing, that one of the things that drives this spirit of disagreement is one thing that the Prophet ﷺ identified as one of the signs of the end of time. He, and so he mentioned Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he mentioned several other things, that everyone is just amazed with their opinion. So, wow, I thought of that. My, I got it going on. Man, y'all just don't know. Man, the kid be thinking. Ooh. And think of everyone's walking around like that. It's going to be hard to agree. Husbands are going to find a difficult time agreeing with their wives. Students agreeing with their teachers. Teachers agreeing with their students. People in the public sphere agreeing with each other. Everyone's just amazed and pleased with their opinion. We need to humble ourselves. And again, to look at humility in this context. So when our Prophet mentions sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَمَا تَوَادَعَ أَحَدٌ لِلَّهِ إِلَّا رَفَعَهُ اللَّهِ No one humbles themselves for the sake of Allah except that Allah elevates them. So we think, some people think humbly, you just walk, you know, I'm humble. Omar saw a guy walking like that, I'm humble. And he went and slapped him on his neck. Bap! And he said, the humility is in your heart, not in your neck. <laughs> so one, one really vitally needed aspect of humility is to humble our opinion. To humble our idea. 
that my idea doesn't have to be the idea. My opinion doesn't have to be the only opinion, right? That's humility. Maybe your opinion is the proper opinion in this situation. Maybe your suggestion is the right suggestion and the one that we should take. And so when we start to look at when, what do we want out of these arguments we get caught up into? Do we want to win the argument? If we want to win the argument with the law, we've lost already. Azawajal. Or do we want the truth to manifest? So when, when Musa alayhi salam and Harun are sent to Fir'aun, they're not sent to overwhelm him, to crush his idea. So Allah Ta'ala says, اِذْهَبَا إِلَى فِرْعَوْنَ إِنَّهُ تَغَى Go to Fir'aun, he's, he's just transgressed beyond, beyond all acceptable limits. So they didn't go to him, you tyrant, deaf to the tyrants, down with the oppressors. فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلَ لَيَّنَ لَعَلَّهُ يَتَذَكَّرُ أَوْ يَخْشَى So say to him a gentle word. So don't go to him screaming. People will never change their opinion if you scream at them. Either they'll be afraid of you and they'll run away, or they'll <laughs> knock your teeth out. <laughs> but they will rarely change their opinion because you're yelling at them. That's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's proven. So, and and this is, these, are, these are spiritual laws. So we, we have to look at things from, from a spiritual perspective. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he meant, إِنَّ اللَّهَ رَفِيقٌ يُحِبُّ الرِّفْقٌ وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُعْطِي عَلَى رِفْقِ مَا لَا يُعْطِي عَلَى الْعُنْفِ That Allah is gentle and He loves gentleness and Allah gives through gentleness what He doesn't give through violence. I was, I was counseling a young lady a couple nights ago. She said, real bad... Mm, with her parents, you know the type. It happens. I mean, really bad. This is bad. And I, I said, hold up. I said, you're trying to get from them through violence something you can only get through gentleness. I said, pick up your phone, call them right now. And tell them, put them both on speaker. Tell them that I love you. We've been having some hard times. Inshallah, we'll get through it. And no matter how hard the times are, I love you. And I, I, I appreciate what you've done for me. And inshallah, we will get through this. And the mother just burst into tears. I said, this is a law. This isn't, you didn't do anything. You didn't do anything. You just brought your words into conformity with a spiritual law. And there are times for firmness, no doubt. So we, we have to learn to humble ourselves. We have to learn to humble our opinions. We have to learn to humble our ideas in those contexts that require someone to back down. And we have to learn to accept, as Imam Shafi mentioned, I, I pray that when I'm in a debate, that the truth is manifested on the tongue of my opponent. Because I want to see the truth. I don't want to see, oh, Shafi got him again. Boy, that Shafi is bad. Oh, man. Don't debate Shafi. No, I want the truth. I don't want you to say how great I am. I want the truth. I'm after the truth. And if the truth is manifested on the tongue of my opponent, that's all the better. Because I'll get the truth without having something to arrogate me and deceive me into thinking that my brilliance or my eloquence facilitated the truth being manifested. So, as we look at the Quran, we should look at those things that are relevant for the situations we find ourselves dealing with. Uh, we, Ithar, giving preference, also giving a preference to the opinion of another. If there's no contradiction, usually these are uh, discussions and debates amenable to differences of opinion. So if there's no, if there's no amenability to a differing opinion, class, 
there's nothing to debate. This is the truth, that's it. But if there is, then learning to give preference to others. وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا They give preference to others even though they themselves have some serious needs. And so I have serious needs, but I could give preference not just to your economic needs, in this case primarily, or your social needs, but even intellectually, and in terms of how we approach different things. Let's try it your way and see what happens. Perhaps you will have tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah ta'ala uh, give us uh, tawfiq in that regard. In concluding, Surah Kaf, the Imam was reading in uh, Maghrib. The, the story of Musa and Khid, uh, Qadir is a story of disagreement. Musa was disagreeing with everything. You know, just be quiet until I tell you what's going on. You know, how can I be quiet about something I can't even comprehend? You know, why did you do that? Why did you scuttle the ship? Why did you kill that boy? Why did you rebuild that wall? And he was never told, like, just shut up, you idiot. Or vice versa. Musa is just questioning. Like, why did you do this? this? And so I'll, you'll find out in due time. And so we will find out in due time the wisdom of the lo- a lot of things we dispute about. So we don't have to have the answer now and the answer is my answer. Sometimes we have to be patient so Allah can manifest the answer over time. Sometimes we have to let things play out and then we'll see the wisdom in the other person's opinion. And so as believers, we're people of patience and we should be people of wisdom and we should be people who appreciate what others bring because our lives are enriched by others. Al-mu'min, al-mu'min, kalbunyan, yushuddu ba'adhu ba'da. The believers are like the individual bricks in a wall. Each one strengthens and supports the next. Your opinion strengthens me. Your intelligence strengthens me. Because collectively the wall is stronger. Barakallahu fikum. Allah yitkabban minkum. So I think it's time for the final phase of the program. And inshallah, if you stay, we can pray Jama'ah afterwards. We have a big Jama'ah with everyone down here. Assalamu alaikum. We will uh, now begin the second half of the program, inshallah. We'll move it a little fast. So thank you for both, both of you for your talks. Um, I want to begin with a quick, short question, um, which has to do with the dangers of polarization. Uh, it's not a trick question. <laughs> Um, but I really want to know uh, your thoughts quickly on um, how dangerous is polarization and, or conversely how important and urgent is it that we actually learn to minimize that and move differently. What, are the, what exactly happens when we live in a polarized society? What are the consequences? Either one of you. you uh, Assalamu alaikum. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Uh, when opinions, positions are so, so far uh, from each other, there's no common ground. And if there's no common ground, there's no basis for discussing anything. And so if there's no base, basis for discussing anything, you just end up with violence. And so I think it's very important to bring work towards uh, narrowing the gap so that we can move into the realm of, of common ground. So that's, that's why it's extremely important to avoid polarization. Also, if we're all polarized, we'll freeze to death. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Dagley, you want to address that? Uh, as a professor, I always have to say, well, what, is, what, what does polarization mean? I mean, I mean, how do we know if something's a good kind of polarization or a bad polarization? <clears throat> it's one of these words um, which is, sounds and is important, but then when it gets down to sort of uh, defining what we mean by it, it becomes a little bit slippery, you know. And so, for, for example, today, uh, you know, I mean, 
that we say that, oh, the Republicans and the Democrats are polarized. All right, maybe so. But then we hear things like, well, the Nazis and the Antifa are polarized. And that doesn't sound exactly right. It doesn't sound like polarization is the right term to use for that. And like you said, I think implicit in the question, maybe it's a good thing for people to be really at antipodes on certain kinds of questions. Uh, but the polarization is not a cause, it's a symptom. And, it's, and, and, it, and I think getting to the deeper causes and to the conditions under which this polarization takes place so easily is, I think, the real problem. I mean, why is it that human beings, when they're presented with a question, they instantly line up on two sides? That, that seems to make sense. I mean, one, I mean, I can't give a comprehensive account, but one, one example is the fact that when you turn on the news, that's exactly what drives their business model. You know, you, you have two guests, they're supposed to argue with each other, uh, and you have a lot of TV shows which are premised exactly on that idea. Talking head one, talking head two, you know, start, start screaming at each other so that the ratings can go up. You know, and, and other th I mean, it's become normalized, and so that's a bad thing. Yeah, let me just say something. Uh, the, the idea that I contextualize polarization in, of divergent ideas, I think there's a very good point in the sense that Islam and Kufr, if you look at those as divergent ideas, maybe there is no middle ground. And so I think what's relevant for us in, in our societal context is when we find people... Uh, discussing a, a common issue, but they're so f far divided and they reject any basis to facilitate a meaningful discussion, trying to narrow that gap by trying to provide a foundation where they can begin to discuss things. So I appreciate that clarification, even though it might not have been intended. Um, Here's a question about, I think this is a broad question, but it really is something that is a recurring issue, particularly for Muslims. Um, how do we engage with people in this dominant culture? And Dr. Dagla, you talked about, you know, we live in a global society. We're not, you know, yeah, we think we're Muslims in the West, and so we have issues, but actually it's a global problem, the cultural problem. How do we engage with people who are intellectual or ideological or political opponents? And if so, how do we do that without compromising beliefs that we hold strongly that are in contradiction to that culture? How do we do that? You know, how do we navigate um, and engage with people who clearly think that Muslim beliefs or Islamic beliefs in some ways are wrong or contradict the cultural norm? Right? How, do we, how, do, how do we engage with that? I, I, first of all, it depends on who you are. Um, there's no one thing that Muslims should be doing in this regard. Uh, so what, what I should do is a lot different from what a journalist should do, and what a, jur what a journalist should do is a lot different from what a, a community organizer or someone who is a school teacher or so forth. I mean, everyone has their own uh, way in which they need to engage in these things. I mean, everyone needs to can benefit from, let's say, everyone can profit from studying works about how to engage with people. I mean, everyone can profit from uh, 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 trying to, to the best of their ability, uh, read and, and be in the presence of people who are a good example of this kind of thing. It's very hard to provide formulas for saying, well, do this, do this, and do this. Because what's at play is institutional limitations. In other words, the very structures in which we live, in a sense, expect us to be in this kind of conflict in some cases. Um, and we're all, I mean, we, have, we fail in cultivating within ourselves, not just, a, not just a kind of a method for acting with other people, but the virtues and the qualities, the human qualities that we're supposed to have, um, such that if you, I mean, if we have those qualities, the answers for how to deal with other people just spontaneously, spontaneously appear. I mean, I, I really believe that. And I think the, the, the ultimate condition for being able to engage with other people is to, first of all, know where you are in, those, in, in, those, in that. So, for example, a lot of Muslims, they want to go out and engage with people. I mean, people want to do that. But, you know, look, since, since we're Muslims in this room, a lot of Muslims want to go and engage with other people, and they don't really know where they're coming from. They, they themselves, they don't know where they're coming from. 
and they're not in a very good position to judge where the other person is coming from. And hence, you have this kind of weird, chaotic uh, situation where they're people just kind of bouncing off of each other. I think if, a, if, if human beings really take the time to first not engage with other people, if I could say, if I could say that, to, to, to engage with themselves intellectually, spiritually, ethically, and kind of calm down and sort of understand where they themselves are coming from, the, the rest of it comes easy because it's, 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 it is different for different people. You know, for, for, for a scholar, it's different from, you know, someone who is just, uh, you know, a shop owner, for example. I, I, that's what I would say. Go ahead, Imam Zayn. I think the, uh, it's important for us to look at the prophetic model in terms of, and it, it indicates something that you just mentioned, Janet, in the sense of purifying yourself first so that you're, you're a reflection of the teachings of the religion. So the Prophet is told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Yuhan Nabi, O Prophet, in the Arsanak as Shahidan, we sent you as a witness. So we should be working to cultivate ourselves spiritually, intellectually, in terms of dress, uh, demeanor, comportment, so that we are a witness to the truth of what we profess, as opposed to being the opposite. Shahidan wa mubashiran. People are doing great things, good things, like, hey, keep doing that and you'll have a good out- outcome. Wa nadiran. Some people are doing bad things, a warner. You know, you keep doing that, there's going to be a bad outcome. You should really consider giving that up. Wa da'yan ilallahi. So, not wa da'yan ila islam, no. Is this a, the, Allah said, wa da'yan ilallahi, a caller to Allah. So we're in a, a situation where atheism and agnosticism is becoming so rampant. The first thing that people, and we believe, the first step is to just try to get people to believe in God. Because we believe there's great good that comes through that. And as a luminant, luminous lamp. And so we should try to shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. So try to let your light shine on the world. And that's, that's the best engagement you can do. So kind of just stand in your place and be who you are and, and present yourself well. From that perspective, From but that also perspective. in those situations, assessing a situation. There might be a situation where you would be Islamically negligent if you didn't praise people and encourage them because of the good thing they're, they're doing. Because they might need encouragement because there's a lot of forces telling you to just have good manners is bad. You know, people think you soft, you're punk, man. You shouldn't be saying please and thank you, man. You should be a gangster. And so encouraging people towards good and there be situations where we be negligent as a Muslim not to warn people against bad things. So just assessing what is the situation. So this situation calls for us not to engage and to be quiet and just try to shine the light. This situation calls for encouraging people. This situation calls for us to warn people. So just trying to assess the situation and see how we can profitably intervene if there's a an avenue for that. Inshallah. I want to turn to the differences inside the Muslim community for a minute. Um, you know, we have, um, I mean, there's a, the, all religions have this between the keepers of what I would call orthodoxy and people, segments of believers within that religion who clash with that orthodoxy. And we have this issue with, with Muslims as well. Um, there tend to be disagreements about doctrine, about theology. Um, how should Muslims in particular deal with such differences? Is it really a matter of saying, no, Islam is a big tent, live and let live, or is there actually a way to have a discourse that respects them without you know, really um, violating the orthodoxy um, yourself in any way? Any ideas on how we navigate those differences? Because they come up periodically, well, as I'll you know. i very quickly before passing the mic, figuratively, that... Uh, what we mentioned, if Musa and Harun are sent to Fir'aun, 
Fir'aun is terrible. Fir'aun is sort of the archetype for a terrible ruler in the Quran. So if they're sent to Fir'aun and they're told to speak gently and kindly to him in order that he might reflect instead of just get mad and say off with their heads. You guys think you are. Don't you know Fir'aun? Off with their heads. Um, I didn't think about it like that. And, and to be rendered in a, a, a reverent, humble position. So if they're sent to Fir'aun, what is it, how do we engage with people who say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. They pray five times a day. They read more Quran than I read. They, but they differ on some theological point. How should we approach them if they're told to approach Fir'aun like that? So I think we have to really step back and think about what we're doing on a day-to-day, maybe a week-to-week, month-to-month basis in terms of when we interact and how we should be interacting with each other. Well, it's something that we, we, we've had to deal with right from the very beginning. There hasn't, there hasn't been a period of Islamic history or a place in Islamic history where this wasn't an issue, where you had... Um, as, you know, as, the word orthodoxy is interesting. I mean, it's 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 it's, it's somewhat, sometimes problematic to associate that with Islam as a concept. But nevertheless, you have, in a sense, those who let's say you consider to be right, or let's say the main, you know, the, or, as you said, orthodox opinion versus something that's either heterodox or marginal or some kind of heresy and so forth. And that's been there since the beginning. But also, what's sometimes implicit in questions about this, from when, when it comes to Islam and people looking at Islam, is that it's seen as being a specifically religious problem. That is to say, religions have this problem that they enforce a kind of an orthodoxy against marginalized people or people with different kinds of ideas, and that's a specifically religious thing that you religious people do, that faith people do. Whereas we, whatever it is, you know, modern people or postmodern people, we, we've solved this issue. We don't, we don't fall into this trap of enforcing orthodoxy, um, which isn't true, uh, which, which is simply not true. On the back. Now, you can juggle the ideas and make assumptions and talk about yourself in a kind of a different way. But the fact of the matter is, you know, this came up with, um, with that recent Graham Wood article in The Atlantic, the one that said uh, ISIS is Islamic, very Islamic. Because, because they know how to quote texts, apparently. That's what makes you Islamic, is being able to kind of quote texts. Um, and, you know, this, you, you have this idea introduced of, well, there are many Islams, and Islam is simply whatever Muslims do. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, but, but this, the problem with that is the, the author of the article would never say, well, modernity is just whatever modern people do, or science is just whatever you do in the name of science, right? They would say, no, no, there's, there there's rules. There you have guidelines. There we can judge between right and wrong, coherent and incoherent, and so forth. But with religion, since that's all arbitrary and kind of subjective and really not based on anything real, orthodoxy is a problem. Actually, every person, in every, everyone believes in something. Everyone has a metaphysical commitment. Everyone has a moral commitment. Everyone has an assumption about how the world works, what's possible and impossible, as I was talking about. And, you know, you might hide that, you might be able to talk around it or something like that. But, and point of fact, if you look at history, religious people are the ones who have been able to deal with these questions of disagreement, orthodoxy, and, and so forth, in actually a much more healthy and productive way. I mean, when you look at them, I mean, how many, um, how many dissenters from the, the dominant view of secularism in the 20th century have been murdered versus how many religious heretics have been murdered? I mean, it's not even, it's, I mean, in relation to the number of, let's say, those who didn't follow the right version of communism, those who don't follow the right version of fascism, those who don't follow the right version of democracy. The number of corpses that have piled up just during the 20th century renders heretics who have died or suffered marginalization undetectable. There's really not even a contest, but since you don't call it orthodoxy, and that's just something religious people do, uh, it, it, it kind of, you, the, the debate is already rigged, you might say, from the beginning. No, I, I mean, I agree with you on that parallel that you've just drawn about people in religion and people in the sort of secular culture, if you will. Um, my question is really, with inside religion, you still have these issues. I mean, you, um, you know, had to deal with that a couple of years ago when the study of Quran came out. People, you know, leveled this idea of that there were, in the commentaries, there were these, um, you know, um, ideas of perennialism in there. Um, I don't want to get into the doctrine issue or the theological issues. I'm, suggest- I'm asking whether you see a way to 
deal with those and what's the proper response when we come across somebody leveling those charges I that think, you, you yeah, know i think there are practical things that you can do because as I, I mean since this has always been going on i mean the first thing is that you, people shouldn't freak out immediately you know i mean th- th- there is basically there's a there's good habits of mind that people can develop which is essentially you say well wait a minute probably i'm not the first one to encounter this kind of problem let me search around for previous examples of people who have done this and maybe figure out what, what that's happened, right? I mean, the, people think that we just showed up and everything that happens is happening for the first time. I mean, every, there's, the, Aristotle said there's nothing new under the sun. That is to say, any philosophical, moral, ethical, any kind of question that you can come up with, has de- I can assure you, someone has had that discussion somewhere in intellectual history. You just have to find it. You just have to kind of look for the example. It won't be the same form. It won't be the same parameters. But the, it, the essential issues will be there somewhere. And then so you can look and study and learn from people's mistakes. And then you can, then you can really investigate your opponent's views. Uh, you can try to ask other people their views about it. In other words, there's a, few, there's a way of engaging in the intellectual culture and so forth in a way that if you do that every time, it's not going to eliminate disagreement. It's not going to solve the problem. But it'll eliminate most of the problems that are just, they don't have to be there in the first place. And, and, in, the, and in the example that you're talking about, it, a little bit of work, a little bit, of, not, a little bit um, of humility, a little bit of sort of saying, wait, wait, let me see what someone else might think about this, it goes a long, long way. You know, it's not a question of solving the problem, it's a question of managing these tensions. Right? That they're never going to go away, but there's... there's you know, it's essentially be, be an adult instead of a child, intellectually speaking. I mean, we, we can do that. There's, these are things which people can accomplish themselves. You know, yeah, I saying? think it's very important also to know our intellectual history. Because if you see the things that Muslims came up with, so for example, if you read in a book called Maqalat uh, Islamiyin, Abu Hassan al Ashari. Just all these different theological positions. You, your head would be spinning around, you're scratching. Muslim, those people were like 300 years from the prophets, so the 700, and they were believing that. And then you'll see a lot of things we differ on are so minor compared to some of those, and they coexisted with each other. Like, you, you, how many people, and most people were killed as heretics, as like Halaj or someone is usually for political reasons, both ancient and modern, and they're very, very few. But their positions were so far from each other, and some of them were so wacky, even entering into what we read and say, this is insane. And Muslims tolerated, they pro- coexisted, and, and the society functioned. So I think we have to go back and familiarize ourselves with that to see that Muslims have coexisted with each other when they had some really very divergent positions. Far, far more divergent than what we're fighting each other over. They coexisted with each other, holding ideas that were far, far, uh, far more, far greater degree of being irreconcilable. Yeah, part of the problem, it seems to me, is um, what both of you just said is also labeling, you know, putting labels on people. You are this and you are that or you're, you know. Um, so I want to turn to the big issue of race. Which it's become more and more heated in, our, in, in this society, certainly, and elsewhere. Um, and the question I re- really, one of the things I'm looking at is um, one criticism against even people who are anti-racist, if you want to call them that, is that, that they're leveling a lot of broad accusations of racism against people. Um, I know you can, I mean, let's set aside the, the sort of David Dukes of the world or the, you know, the, the self-proclaimed white supremacists, but in the broader culture, um, are we too quick to label people um, something that somebody said or something somebody um, believes as, oh, if you say that, if you believe that, you are clearly a racist, rather than try to separate the person from their beliefs and also try to understand, um, you know, that maybe they're not really racist, but they do have some beliefs, as you said, Dr. Dagli, I mean, they have their 
orientation, their knowledge base, and they have what they believe is, is you know, um, the structure, the, uh, the dimensions of thought that you talked about. So is there something in there that um, we need to pull back from a little bit about these harsh labels of, of the minute somebody does this or they say X or they align with Y, they're automatically racist? Any thoughts on that? <laughs> just, just generally, um, again, to, you know, being the professor, uh, always talking about vocabulary. Um, Racist is, is a little bit overused sometimes. It's an overused term, not because people don't deserve it, mm -hmm. but because there's other relevant terms that can make some differentiation. So I remember in my own lifetime growing up, there were other words that I heard a lot more which seemed to have disappeared off of the radar. Prejudice, bias, uh, bigotry, um, ignorance, um, and so forth. And so, you know... And, you know, and some words which have now come into the fore, which I think are actually are very useful, which most notably the phrase white supremacy, which I, which, and supremacism, which I actually find, I, I find that to be actually helpful in limited, in, in when it's used precisely. Uh, but the problem is, is, is as with anything, uh, when, when you have too many things which are, you, which are meant by a single word, it leads to a, a real difficulty in kind of communicating, because... People are racist, ideas are racist, institutions are racist, countries are racist, words are racist. I mean, so many things are racist. They can't all, be, that can't all be the same thing. You know, a human being can't have the same attribute as an idea. There has to be something that can differentiate them from each other. I think that's one problem. You know, and, and the way I think about it, when I, when I look at all the problems today, I mean, when, you know, there's, we have examples from the lifetime of the Prophet, at least, to And, um, to me, it's a subset, you might say. This idea of racism is a subset of jahl, that really incredible word in Arabic, which is hard to translate. It's a kind of a combination between ignorance and stupidity, kind of stubborn stupidity, right? And so the idea behind racism as a form of jahl, which it is, it means that you can do something about it. But, the, but sometimes, the, the biggest problem in the discourse today is when racism, this word racism or something else, becomes a thing that you can't ever become free of because of who you are. That, that I think, is the, that's when you go too far. And so if you're such and such a person, you can never not be a supremacist of some kind or a racist or something of some kind because of where you came from and what your profile is. And I think that's bad. But if you frame it in terms of ignorance and stupidity then it's something that people can overcome, and we know that people do overcome it. That's a more productive way, I think, of thinking about it. I think uh, that's a very, very important point. In terms of what Dr. Jack Brown mentioned, like words define our reality. And as Muslims, we should be going back to our Quranic and our Muslim vocabulary to find the words that are relevant in our modern context. And racism is not, if you ask, it didn't exist. Like, Jahil did. But you, you may become some unsuri, anti unsuri. Like, you're a racist. But the prophet never called anyone unsuri. So, when uh, Abu Dhar insulted Bilal, Yabna Sauda, oh, you son of a black woman, the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you're a man, you still have vestiges of this pre-Islamic ignorance, arrogance, those combinations of meaning that come with, with jahil. And so I think this is something we can offer our society. I think we in America, historically, one reason we've had as a society such a hard time getting beyond this whole issue of racism is because we haven't had the language to effectively talk to each other about it. And so maybe Muslims, we could help contribute a new set of words to the discourse that will help to give people a foundation to begin properly talking about it. Because when you say certain things, conversations end. I've seen it. I, I, I don't want to give you an example, but I was in an audience. Someone said, don't do this. Don't say this. You're going to lose them. And I did it anyway. Literally, the whole audience, it was in Cheshire, Connecticut, in the wintertime, after 
and in the library, public library, and all these people came and they like literally, zhoop, they just went silent. Their faces changed before that. They were engaging. And so I think it's really important for us to begin to talk about these things in different ways. Why? Because do we want to insult people? Do we want them to shut down forever? Do we want them to hate us? Uh, you call someone a racist, and even though their actions, based on the reigning common journalistic definition of a racist, might point in that direction, if they don't see themselves as a racist, you, got, you have a real problem. And so do we want to solve problems? Do we want to change attitudes? Or do we just want to shut people down and deepen the divides between us? We have to ask ourselves. If we want to shut people down, deepen the divide, just continue to lob these bombs at each other and the divides will get deeper and deeper and deeper. And, and I would add one more thing, which is that it, it, the discourse, when it's, when it's degraded in that way, it precisely um, uh, uh, hinders people from actually being able to look at the world and the history uh, in a way that's kind of cool-headed. And, and it's, it sort of assumes that you can just figure out what somebody is, and then it's over. We don't have to talk about it anymore. Instead of actually studying the history and being able to understand why things are the way that they are. And I've seen that happen a lot, where it's just a question of, like, well, somebody used the buzzword, they're a racist, it's over. Um, whereas if we really want to understand, I mean, I, for, for example, um, when you're careful about uh, terminology, the, 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 an author who I, I think he's a great writer, but he's wrong on a couple of things, ta Coates, who's probably the most influential writer on race today, um, he did a great service, I think, by differentiating the mere idea of racism from the idea of white supremacism. I thought that was very helpful. Uh, he, I think he goes too far in other directions, um, but the fact that in doing so, he kind of brought to bear a historical analysis and people's intentions. So I thought it was very good in that respect. Um, but, but when you just are doing pure um, what's called identity politics, you rob people of the ability to think. You know, it's, it's just, it, it, and it, it doesn't just rob their ability to think about that issue. That then permeates into other issues as well, relations between men and women, uh, you know, relations within family. It, I mean, it really does have a negative effect. These all relate to each other. Uh, following up on that, there's a related I issue that I want to bring up, which is um, in the past we've had people like, uh, you know, the Reverend Martin Luther King and even James Baldwin and others who have actually expressed some sympathy for white people who are sort of victims of demagoguery. I mean, they're not, they, don't, they didn't see them, them, these people as racist, but rather as victims. I mean... Uh, Bob Dylan wrote a song about the guy who killed Medgar Evers. So, you know, he called it a pawn in their game. He referred to him as, as a victim of, you know, demagogues, essentially. Um, and I want to read a quotation to you from Dr. Martin Luther King and ask a quick question. Here's the quotation. I found it um, very fascinating. It is evil we are seeking to defeat, not the persons victimized by evil. Those of us who struggle against racial injustice must come to see that the basic tension is not between races. The tension is not between white people and Negro people. The tension is at bottom between justice and injustice, between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. And if there is a victory, it will be a victory not merely for 50,000 Negroes, but a victory for justice and the forces of light. And here's the last part of it. We are out to defeat injustice and not white persons who may happen to be unjust. So my question is, should we be a little bit more understanding and sympathetic to the realities of our opponents and where they're coming from and what happened and why they believe what they believe? Well, Muslims, you're taught, right? we hate the sin, not the sinner. And this, again, this comes from the Prophet Wasallam. He didn't hate Abu Sufyan or Hind or Amr bin al-As or Khalid bin al-Walid. People were trying to kill him and did kill many of his companions. He hated what they were doing. He hated what they believed in, and he, that's what he, and so when they dropped that, they became his beloved companions. He loved Khalid, he loved Amr bin al-As. So I think that's instructive for us in that particular context, that we hate the sin, but not the sinner. And when the sinner leaves the sin, or when we're able to dissuade them from engaging in the sin, we can love them. Uh, yet those, 
uh, those hadith uh, that uh, they're very tough to read. The ones that require you to uh, be good, be good to people who mistreat you. I mean, that is very difficult to do. I mean, it's kind of really bites. It's a, it's a really tough thing to do. And we, I mean, we find lots of ways of exempting ourselves from having to do it, which is to say, well, if somebody does this to me, I'm going to come back at them, you know, firing on with you know all cylinders. Um, and but the thing is that that has to be balanced. Uh, so, so I mean, that's the absolute. The absolute. We have the absolute requirement to have uh, to, uh, that if somebody objectively mistreats us, and even if they are guilty, and, and if we can't identify a personal sin on their part, to be able to incorporate into the way that we live with people this very difficult uh, idea of not not responding in kind, which is which you hardly see anymore. I mean, and, and when you do see it, it's extremely effective. Not that you do it because it's effective, but it is effective. I mean, it does work. It really does change people. But then on the other side of it, and I admit to struggling with this, how do, intellectually, how do you not become a dupe or a sucker for, for, for a, a political culture and, and a kind of a, 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 that is very skilled at, at, at playing games with words and kind of setting traps for people and wasting other people's time and gaslighting, gaslighting, I mean, you know, sort of, Make, making people like doubt their very reality in kind of very clever ways, and just being an expert in manipula- manipulation and so forth. And so, you know, the the um, the the challenge of just loving the enemy becomes complicated by the fact that sometimes, you know, you, you don't know exactly what the enemy is doing. You might say what your opponent is doing in this regard. I don't know if I'm making sense in that regard. No, I think you are. And, and I, I think this is where faith comes in. Because without faith, a lot of things we're told to do make absolutely no sense. And the, you know, even the possibility of bringing ourselves to do them is extremely difficult. But with faith, so I think this is something that, and Allah Ta'ala addresses this. For, for example, when janhulis silmi, fajnah laha wa tawakkal ala Allah. So if you're, even in the context of a, of a battle, if your enemy is inclined towards peace, you so inclined and trust in Allah. Trust in Allah what? That is not a scheme. They're not trying to trick us. They're not trying to regroup. So just trust in Allah. So I think it's, it's very important for us to introduce that again into the, the discourse that, okay, a lot of things we're trying to accomplish in society, if you remove Allah, if it ain't Allah, where's Allah in all this? <clears throat> Is mission impossible? But when we trust in Allah, so wala testa wal hasanatu wala sayya, good and evil are not equal. It fa'abilati hi ahsan, respond to evil with that which is better, with good. Fa idha ladi bayna ka wa bainu ada wa ka in huliun hamim. And you will see unexpectedly because we, uh, if I do this, he'll think I'm a sucker, I'm a punk, I'm a chump, I'm a pushover. But Allah will change his or her heart. Allah, will, and so what you expect, you're, you're basing your expectations on human reason and human experience. But when you introduce the divine, now it's beyond human capabilities and reason and experience. There's a whole other realm for seeing things. Thank you for that. I want to move on to one other quick question about um, this idea of justice. Um, you know, there's a rallying cry among activists, people, and there are Muslims who are activists, and there are people, activists everywhere. Um, and the cry goes, no justice, no peace. Um, it's very popular. It's been around for a long time. Um, but we have Muslim scholars, and I think I hope I'm not wrong. Sheikh Bin Bayah actually did um, say this himself, that the pursuit of peace is paramount. That you cannot have put, say, no justice, no peace. You have to have peace first before you can... And justice is a good value, but it is secondary. Any thoughts on how we resolve that activist and sort of um, you know, spiritual or scholarly advice? Uh, I think is, first of all, we have to realize that, for example, uh, Marxism, by way of example, 
is a worldview that says we have to have justice for the working class. And we have to have justice for the oppressed classes in society. This is a requisite for a human liberation from the end of, for ending alienation, humans being separated from the product of their labor, and this being the foundation of alienation. And so only by uniting them with the product of their labor, which entails ending the oppression of the uh, bourgeoisie, this is how humans will become fulfilled. So you have to have justice. Islam says you work for justice, but in that, in human society, there will always be injustice. While you're working for justice, here's some tools to cope with injustice. So Marxism says we have to get rid of justice, but doesn't give any coping tools or mechanisms to deal with injustice. And so what happens? You commit suicide or go out and murder everyone that you think is associated with your oppressor. And as, as Muslims, as our minds become more secularized, we do the same things. You look at all these groups, you know, they're being oppressed by America and Israel. There's no Israeli or American soldiers on the battlefield. So we get a fatwa that these countries that are aligned with America, Israel, even though they're all Muslim, that they're kufr, they're kafirs, and the police that protect them in the army are kafirs, so we can kill the police cadets and we can blow up uh, checkpoints and we can murder. So, so we have to understand that more than Islam advocates for the eradication of justice, and it does, it gives us tools to deal with injustice. Otherwise, you know, women have been struggling way before Susan B. Anthony, right? And still there's not equal pay for equal work. And so unless there's some coping mechanisms for women, like dhikr and Quran, and uh, looking at the the bounties and graces of Allah in one's life, you're going to have a, a, all women are going to be thoroughly miserable. But their sisters are laughing and partying and enjoying each other's company. And the same thing with, you look at any other oppressed group in society. So we have to really focus on understanding the nature of the world. The nature of the world is that there's always going to be some injustice. All right, African Americans have been struggling since before the country was a country, and then struggling at the time of when the country and three fifths of a man, and struggling at the Civil War where slavery is the it was the issue, and the twenty first twentieth century would be the problem of the color line, and then Brown versus the Board of Education which means what? We need to desegregate. Thing, things are still wrong, and now we have all this stuff we have now, but. While people were struggling from Denmark Vesey or Nat Turner or however people, or Frederick Douglass or Ida B. Wells or come into the 20th century, W.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington and then into the 30s with A. Philip Randolph and Ralph Bunch and all of these folks and Dr. King and Malcolm and everybody who's struggling with this persistent injustice People were still partying <laughs> and enjoying their babies and enjoying their families because they could cope. And so what we're doing now, we're taking the ability to cope away from people and people are just becoming wretched and desperate and moved to, to just irrational ways. So we have to have a balance and we have to see that Definitely, we, there are injustices, they're in our society. Quran encourages us to struggle against them, but in the meantime, we have to cope so we can relax and smile and enjoy life as we struggle. If you, if you were to, um, let's, let's take this kind of metaphor of, the, of you know, being a pilot of the three dimensions of thought. 
So one question that you can ask the, the types of activists or the people who say things like no justice, no peace, or even other seemingly innocuous statements like um, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, or uh, so long as anyone lives in bondage, I can never be free. You know, these, are, these sound good, but actually then when you think about it, you have to ask, what, what is a human being? It's a very general kind of philosophy. What is a human being? What is the reality of a human being such that that moral stance makes sense and is meaningful? In other words, how does your vision of what a human being is tie together with your moral commitment? I think a lot, and I can't, I'm not going to mind read all the activists who ever say such things, but generally speaking, because I've looked at the origin of some of the terminology, you know, th things like the use of the word identity and, 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 the, and the social justice movement and so forth and so on, you might say the metaphysical foundations or the, the general worldview tends to be one which is, which is either Marxist or something like it, which essentially reduces human beings to their interactions with each other. That is to say, what a human being is and his or her ethical sphere is completely what, how they connect with other people, whether that's through class, gender, uh, race, and other kinds of things. And the question of what a human being is, what Islamic theology and thought would say inwardly, it's not necessarily denied, but it just is invisible. It's not talked about. Whereas in Islamic thought, you always begin from the notion that a human being is an immortal soul and there's a definite psychology, there's a, there's a development, there's an idea of what it means to realize human nature, right? The sunnah, despite what um, some, even Muslims say, I mean, you see this, when Muslims, they say that the sunnah is essentially some kind of social justice program. It's not. I mean, it has features which have similarities with a social justice program. But to reduce it to that is a terrible, terrible mistake. There's an outer sunnah, and there's what you could call, in a sense, an inner sunnah. That is to say, you have the way that the Prophet ﷺ acted, dealt with people, governed, and so forth. But then there's also the way in which he exemplified what it meant to be a soul, right? The way in which his spirit and, and his luminosity existed as a human, just in him. And Muslims have always been concerned with that first, and then everything else as a function of that. And then when you lose the other things, if you encounter injustice, if you encounter suffering or these kind of things, you, don't, you still don't lose that because that's what's, that's what's for, first and foremost. Amongst the five um, maqasid, that is, that amongst the theorists of, theorists of law, they say, what are the five things that you have to have in a society in order for it to be a society? The first one is always deen. The first one is always religion. Because that's, that's what you need when you, after you, that's the thing that counts most of all. Without it, the other things are secondary. But when you have an ideology, let's say Marxism or postmodernism of its various kinds, which basically reduces people to their interactions with each other, injustice suddenly becomes a threat to one's entire sense of being. Because there's nothing else. There's just society. There's just my interactions with people. There's only freedom. And if there's no freedom, there's nothing else. And people lose it. And, and the worst part of that, if you look at the crimes especially of the 20th century, is that when someone adopts a program like this and reduces human beings to their interactions with each other, everything becomes permissible in the name of that program. You know, and, and, and we've seen in the last 100 years how this rebellion against the sacred and against religion has resulted in various programs like communism, fascism, democratism, and liberalism, which in one way or another say that, look, we have to come up with this order of human society, justice or freedom or, or the kind of the related terms, and we can pay any price to get to that because it's a kind of a pure good, which usually includes the deaths of, of millions of innocent people. I mean, that's not a small matter. I mean, that's not a small matter. And I believe it's directly tied to the loss of the vision of a human being as first and foremost a soul, an immortal soul, who, whose first responsibility in life is to care for themselves. I'll just leave with one quick thing. I think there's a lot of Muslims who have good intentions, but who don't really pay attention, for example, to the story of the, of the sleepers of the cave. These were, these, were, these were people who, when they saw the corruption of the society, they didn't engage on a crusade to kind of reform society. They said, things have gotten so bad, we have to save our souls. We have to save ourselves. And they went and they retreated to a cave. They weren't criticized for that. They were celebrated for that because they prioritized properly. 
And, and that requires a vision of what a human being is. It requires a vision of reality, which it needs to be cared for. We can't just assume that we're always going to have it. And that's what's important to be close to the Qur'an, because those messages in terms of how we form our worldview and what do we prioritize in the world, they're conveyed through the Qur'an. When, when Allah mentions the salvation of that soul first and foremost, you know, uh, uh, He will forgive your, your sins, you your sins. ويدخلكم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار ومساكن طيبة في جنة عدن ذلك الفوز العظيم and beautiful mansions and gardens of Edens with rivers flowing beneath them that is the great victory وأخرى تحبونها something else but it's secondary أخرى تحبونها نصر من الله وفته قريب وبشر المؤمنين Help from Allah and a speedy victory in your worldly struggles. Give glad tidings to those who believe. So the, the first thing, the foremost thing, is saving our souls. As the Christians, they say, like, what profits, uh, what profits a man if he gains the world, but he loses his very soul? I mean, what does it mean, Philistines liberated and all of the oppression that Muslims are found and the Rohingya, may Allah uh, help us to help them. But all those problems are solved, but in ways and means that we all go to hell. We're killing innocent people. We're violating every teaching of the religion. And so what, what does that mean? Because this is the world. This is the dunya. We're at dunya sa. It's a moment, fleeting moment, then we're gone. Eternity is forever. And so what does it mean to gain something in this world if we, and that we enjoy for five years, two years, three years, four years, 10 years, 20, 30, but we lose the rest of eternity. So we have to kind of look at the big picture, if you will. Um. Both of you mentioned uh, different aspects of the soul, and then you talked about metaphysics as well, so I want to turn a little bit to this topic that you had raised earlier um, in your talk briefly, but which is about science. Science, um, you know, it's the idea, the idea of the unseen, which is what we're talking about. Science doesn't have anything to say about that, because if it's not measured empirically, if it cannot be measured empirically, it doesn't exist. It's kind of the basic assumption there. But in theology, we also have this, you know, sort of a belief in the unseen. We do, but science also does that. I mean, now they're talking about dark matter and things like that that are also, you know, not really seen, right? Um, so my question really is, as believers, um, how do we, you know, think about the materialist sort of commitments of science, and how do we respond to that without sort of becoming almost agnostic about science? It's a, it's a very hard question to answer briefly. But um, uh, okay, I'll, 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 one thing that we often forget, actually, is that it didn't start with dark matter and kind of the weirdness of physics uh, today, like the multiverse, dark matter, and quantum mechanics. It goes way back before that. And actually, it goes back to the birth of modern science. What we call the scientific revolution, which was, was neither scientific nor a revolution, you know, you know, according, like for example, there's a, there's a very good book by Stephen Chapin on that subject, which he says precisely that. Um, what happened in the scientific revolution was that the Christian worldview, uh, which was very similar to the traditional Islamic worldview, uh, was was rejected in favor of a very specific way of looking at the world. It wasn't simply, oh, we want to be rational and scientific now, whereas we used to be superstitious. There was a very specific cosmological vision, which was to say that rather than the kind of Aristotelian vision of form and matter and sympathies and antipathies and that traditional kind of pre-modern worldview, we believe that the entire world, all things are basically machine-like. That is to say, and it, they are things that, a, that an artisan could make. That became the vision. So when you think about people like Descartes, Newton, Galileo, and so forth, what did they believe that the world was? They still believed in God. They believed that God created the world. But they literally believed that in order for what they called philosophy, what we would call science, to really be truly 
intelligible, for it to really truly be what it is, we have to be able to explain all things in terms of mechanical causes. In other words, like if you were to open up a clock or a watch, it would have to look like that. Newton came along and then explained gravity in terms which destroyed that mechanical vision because obviously, from, from their point of view, gravity has no mechanical cause. So he explained gravity, and much to his own consternation, he was very unhappy with this, as were, as were his colleagues. He explained gravity, but not with mechanical causes. So you had a revolution that overturned the idea of the invisible, the, uh, overturned the idea of, let's say, non-mechanical causes and tried to reduce the mechanism. And then you had the reintroduction of invisible causes, but in a different form, beginning with gravity and moving forward. And so the scientist, science believes in invisible things as well. It's just that those things, as you said, they have to be quantified. And um, it's even a, a small aspect of that, that. That history, in a sense, is something that really needs to be understood in order to be able to situate precisely how religion stands in relation to science. Because the original promise, this idea of materialism, mm -hmm. nobody knows what matter is anymore. Ask a scientist, what is matter? Matter, we don't, we don't know what matter is. Matter is whatever physicists study. That's what they'll tell you. But, but the vision of the world that overturned religion had a very definite idea of what matter was. It's levers and screws and things like that. And eventually we discovered that this is how the world works. That itself, is, it, it, our, if, if you just contextualize the debate between science and religion with that sort of little bit of history, a lot of other things, I mean, I don't want to go on too long. It's a big topic, but. No, no thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, we're sort of running out of time, so I'm going to ask both of you to do something, um, kind of last thoughts. If you were to leave our audience tonight with something to think about regarding disagreement and how we navigate this thing, what is it that you want them to think about and what advice or counsel do you have for the rest of us on um, dealing with differences? Have you talked about humility? You've talked about a lot of different things tonight and I just want you to sort of um, think about leaving us with a final thought about... Um, what we should go walk out of here thinking about and, 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 and ponder. I, I want to give the last word to Imam Zaid, so I'll, I have a very, I'll be very brief. Get, o get off of social media, <laughs> really. Get off of social media and get all of your knowledge from books. Take me. <laughs> because Allah said, Iqra. Allah didn't say, Shahid. <laughs> He said, read. He didn't say, look. I would say, uh, when you have an idea that you're just hell-bent on knowing that, believing this is right, this is it, give yourself 10 years before you express that publicly. <laughs> On that note, please join me in a round of applause for our speakers tonight. <laughs>